want to welcome our uh, guest speaker this morning, Dr. Mark Smith. He comes from Cedarville uh, University. Dr. Smith teaches courses in American politics, constitutional law, and research methodology. Um, he also serves as a director of the Center for Political Studies at, at Cedarville, and he's a frequent uh, speak it, speaker as, a, as pulpit supply. Please welcome Dr. Smith. All right. So I suppose this is Pittsburgh Steelers country, is that right? As a long-suffering Colts fan, I hope that we can still have fellowship uh, this morning. Um, I have a lot of respect for the Steelers. That doesn't mean I like them, but I have a lot of respect for the Steelers. Uh, greetings from Cedarville University. Uh, greetings from Dr. Thomas White, our president. Uh, I've been at Cedarville for 18 years. This is almost the end of my 18th year. Um, I really can't explain what's going on at Cedarville in the sense, you know, we continue to grow by leaps and bounds. Uh, we continue to have the largest incoming class that we've ever had. And uh, since I've been there, our student population has basically doubled. Uh, and it's just remarkable to see. Uh, we're just a little school in the middle of cornfields that God continues to bless. And I really don't quite understand it. But it's a blessing to be there. And it's a blessing to be with you this morning. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I'm a professor, not a pastor. And that's going to be obvious if it's not already. Uh, and I'll take a slightly different approach to things than maybe what you're used to, but hopefully uh, you can bear with me. You may want to turn your Bible to Mark chapter 5. So I will get there in just a moment, but we're going to spend most of our time this morning in Mark chapter 5. I don't know if you're like me, uh, but I grew up probably watching too much television. Uh, it wasn't that my parents let me watch too much television, but I would sneak in television whenever I could, uh, whether it was before school, after school, early Saturday morning. Uh, I tended to watch TV when I could. I also remember uh, growing up that there were odd shows. You know, there were shows that were, that were on TV in different times. Uh, that were 30, 40, sometimes even uh, 50 years old. And I remember consuming some of those shows. One of them that I remember watching a fair bit was called To Tell the Truth. This may be familiar to some of you, I don't know. I know they've done a, a resurrection of this show recently. But To Tell the Truth was always interesting. There was a panel of celebrities, and they would try to guess the true identity of one of three people. So all three of the guests would all claim to be the same person. And then the celebrity panel would ask them questions and try to figure out which was the true person and which two were the imposters. I went back recently and watched an episode and the gentleman, all three gentlemen claimed to be someone named Robert Sheridan. You know, and what's interesting about Robert Sheridan, not a celebrity, not anybody famous obviously, he had amnesia for 20 years which is interesting. And so the celebrities asked all three of these gentlemen questions, you know, when did you have amnesia? Uh, when did you figure out that you had it? Did, how did you go through hypnosis? Did you report yourself to the authorities? What happened here and there? And the three gentlemen sort of stumbled through answers. And of course, you know how the show ends. The announcer says, will the real Robert Sheridan please stand up? And the three men kind of sheepishly look at each other. They all sort of start to stand up. And then finally, one person reveals himself as the true Robert Sheridan. It's a show that's about identity. We're trying to figure out who is a true person, who's authentic, and who are the imposters. In today's world, and this has been true for a long time, but in today's world, I feel like that we're looking at different versions of Jesus Christ. There's a panel of people all claiming to be Christ sitting in front of us. Some of them are warm and fuzzy. Some of them are distant and cold. Some of them are good teachers. 
But who's the real Jesus Christ? How do we know the real Christ from the imposters of Christ? And maybe, and which is the title of my sermon this morning, most dangerously, I think our largest conception of Christ is we've turned him into ourselves. Christ has become an image of us. So no longer do we see ourselves as created in God's image. We have created Christ in our image. And that fits uniquely with our culture, with where we are right now. Well, Mark chapter 5 deals with this question, and it answers this question. Who is Jesus Christ? And just to tell you, I, Jesus, is nowhere to be found in this chapter. What we do find here, though, is authentic, actual Jesus Christ in all of his glory. So Mark is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Maybe just because it's my name, I don't know. But it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It does not have any kind of mystery at all about who Christ is. The very first chapter and the very first verse says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark starts out his whole gospel. It's, this is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. What's fascinating about the book, though, is how almost no one else figures it out throughout the book. The disciples struggle with figuring out who Jesus is. Those who surround Christ struggle with figuring out who Jesus is. Even his own family members, his friends, his associates, his town, all struggle to figure out who is this Jesus that we see. Mark chapter 5 answers this question. So let's turn to that text. And let's read the first uh, half of this chapter. So bear with me. So they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there in the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he's getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but he said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. So what we see here is Christ exercising power over evil. Christ has authority over evil. We see quickly here in Mark chapter 5. This man is described as having an impure spirit. We know that he's possessed, however we want to think of that. But impurity is also suggested by his surroundings. He's in the tombs. These tombs mean that this man is cut off from society. He's isolated. 
He's surrounded by death. And we can see from this description that he is beyond human intervention. People have tried to chain him and bind him. He breaks those. He appears to be getting stronger, which is frightening. And he also appears to be bent on self-destruction. He's cutting himself, harming himself. He's beyond help. But then when Christ comes onto the scene, everything changes. Immediately, one of Mark's favorite words, immediately things change when Christ arrives. So how do we see things change? The man runs to Christ and falls down before him. It's obvious that the demon is fully aware of who Jesus Christ is. It's less obvious that anyone else around is fully aware of that. The demon appeals to God. Not only does he know that Jesus is God, but he knows he's the Son of God. He appeals to God. In the name of God, don't torment me. Well, this is a little bit uh, you know, ironic, I suppose, that the demon is begging not to be tormented by Christ when he has spent however many years tormenting this poor man. The demon is asking for mercy when he has shown no mercy throughout this process. Christ shows his authority by forcing the demon to name itself, and of course it gives this very chilling name of legion. In this context, we'd have to think this refers to a Roman legion. You know, Roman legions had about 6,000 foot soldiers, 120 horsemen, and then various support personnel. So we're looking at something that's just unimaginable in terms of the numbers here. Christ, though, forces it to name itself and establishes power over it in the process. But next we see Christ, and I'm going to be really honest with you, this part of the passage just troubles me. It's just troubling. It's hard for me to wrap my head around what I'm looking at here. Christ agrees to send the demon into the herd of pigs. And the pigs go running off the side of the cliff into the sea and are drowned. It's disturbing on the one hand because of how much good bacon is being wasted by this process. Think of all the sausage and the bacon that could be had from those 2,000 pigs. It's a tragedy. But more seriously, what's happening here? What is Jesus doing? I mean, the pigs are ritually unclean for Jews. We know that. However, think of the amount of wealth that we're seeing on the side of that hill. A herd of 2,000 pigs. Think of the number of jobs that are bound up in caring for those pigs. The shepherds. So we have an economic interest in whoever owns them. We have employment interests in the people who work to care for this herd. And Christ just... Eh, Go ahead. Go off the side of the hill. Drown. What is Jesus doing here? Why would he choose to seemingly torment the shepherds and the owners of this herd? When he could have done anything. He could have snapped his fingers and sent those demons straight to hell. He could have snapped his fingers and, and said, you're out of existence. He could have done whatever he wanted to do with the demons because he's God. Instead, he sends them into the pigs. And so we're left with this question of why. Well, I think the rest of the passage actually gets us to the answer here, and it's not a pleasant answer. It's uncomfortable. How do the people respond to Christ once they've seen what he's done? We see here that the shepherds leave. They go into the surrounding country. They tell people what's happened. People begin to then come to the scene, and what do they see? They see the demon-possessed man, who's now in his right mind, healed, and they've seen 2,000 pigs destroyed. So when confronted with Jesus... These people now have a choice to make. Do 
they are beginning to understand that this person in front of them is not normal. He's not human in the same way that they are human. He has worked miracles. He's done things that are unimaginable just in a short period of time. And they have a decision to make. Either they get down on their knees and worship him as the son of God, or they beg him to leave. You know, I think that many of us have a misunderstanding of Jesus in the following way. I think when we think of ourselves as in the presence of Christ, we think of it as a warm and fuzzy experience. We think it'd be like greeting a long-lost friend, hugging a distant relative. I think the reality is, in the presence of Christ, we would all be reminded of our own wickedness. We would be confronted with his holiness. And what's the proper response to his holiness? You have to be aware then of your own flaws and of your own sin and of your own need for salvation. And that's not comforting. That's not pleasant. That's not easy. And so these people, when confronted with the real Jesus, they decide to beg him to leave. So by destroying that herd of pigs, allowing it to be destroyed, Christ presents them with a decision. And they make it. And they make exactly the wrong decision. So in his own way, I think, honestly, the destruction of that herd of pigs is a judgment upon these people and upon this town and upon these shepherds and upon these owners and the other people who can't bear to be confronted with the actual, true Jesus Christ. We see in the next passage here, let's look at verse 21. We see two more miracles take place. And these are very familiar uh, miracles, but let's read very quickly through this, and I won't spend much time. But let's read through uh, verse 21 through the end of the chapter. And when Jesus had crossed again into the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around, or turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So we've seen in the previous part of the chapter that Christ exercises power over evil. 
power over nature. We see here him exercising power over sickness and power over death. Let's talk about the woman first. So even though her story is sort of sandwiched in between Jairus' story, let's talk about her for just a second. Like the demoniac, the woman is socially isolated. She would be thought to be impure based on her medical condition. She's also beyond human help. She's had this problem for 12 years. She's sought physicians. She's spent all of her money and she's gotten no results. Just like with the demoniac, when Christ comes onto the scene, everything changes immediately. Hearing about him, she touches his garment as an act of faith. And there's no other, other way to put it. She's miraculously healed. Christ acknowledges that her faith is what has healed her. Her faith is in who Christ is and who she thinks he is. So like the demoniac, she appears to be fully aware of who Christ is, and she acts upon it. The story of Jairus is equally interesting, but in a different way. You know, the, the text here describes him as a ruler of the synagogue. This is probably a lay person, not a formal religious leader, but a, an administrator. And most likely he is a Pharisee. Now, if you know your timeline of Christ's life, the Pharisees are already plotting to kill Christ. So this man has broken from his social circle, broken from his friends, broken from those that he works with, and pursues Christ to heal his daughter. And we see, of course, the remarkable results in the face of taunting and derision, Christ heals her. He raises her from the dead. This is a beautiful, moving picture of the resurrection that's to come for all of us. Christ demonstrates his power over even death itself. He will give himself to the cross. Through his death, we will be able to overcome death because of his sacrifice. And we see that represented here. So in this text, who is this Jesus that we've con been confronted with? I want to answer for just a moment about our culture's two best explanations for who Jesus really is. Not mine. We'll talk, you know, we've talked about mine. But who do they think Jesus is? Jesus can't be ignored. So you have to deal with him at some level. He's a part of history. There's a great religion that's rooted itself in Christ. And so how do you deal with him as someone who isn't a believer? Well, there's what I'll call the modern answer to Jesus. A modern person is someone who's a believer in science. They believe in the universe because they can see it and touch it and smell it and taste it and measure it. They believe that they can know all of reality through their senses. Therefore, if I can't see it, then it must not exist. This is a person who's bound up in the natural world, but who sees no indication of anything supernatural. There's only what we can observe. You know, the great uh, famous Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, first human in space, as he goes out of Earth's atmosphere and breaches space, he is quoted as saying, I don't see any God up here. That's a perfect statement of the natural mindset. If I can't see it, then it must not exist. 
Naturalists are firm believers in evolution. For them, who is Christ then? He can't be ignored. So who is he? For most naturalists, Christ is a great teacher. He's given us one of the best ethical systems in the history of the world. Love your neighbor. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. For them, Christ is good, but he's not God. This chapter does not give us this as an option. Christ isn't merely good in Mark chapter 5. He is God. How do we know that? Because of his performance of miraculous things that can only be explained by his divinity. You know, our culture, like many things, has cheapened the idea of a miracle. You know, when I think of the word miracle, the first thing that pops into my mind is the United States men's hockey team in 1980. What did Al Michaels say when they defeated the Russians? Do you believe in miracles? Yes. As much as I admire that moment, that's not a miracle. A miracle is God's supernatural intervention into our reality to achieve his purposes. Those miracles are a testimony to the kingdom of God and the entrance of the kingdom of God into our time and our place. Those miracles are a testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. Christ claims the power to do miracles, and he does them. One of our founding fathers was acutely aware of this issue. Thomas Jefferson went through the New Testament and edited it and took out the miracles because those couldn't be possibly true. And since they can't be true, what emerges from the New Testament once the miracles are gone? Jesus as this great, noble, wonderful, ethical teacher, and that's all that's there. Again, Christ isn't only good. He is a great, good, ethical teacher, but he's not just that. He's also God. And we have to be aware of that. The next explanation that you see in our culture is the I, Jesus. The I, Jesus. So, you probably, almost all of you, have one of these in your pocket. This is an iPhone, but any kind of smartphone is the same thing. What does the iPhone really do? You know what it does is it puts me in control. I can watch almost any movie that's ever been made in history by looking it up and paying for it through my iPhone. I can listen to almost any recorded song. I can order custom-made sneakers from the Converse website. I can order food. I can order, I can order my universe, essentially, through the power of an iPhone. It is a perfect postmodern device because it puts me in the center of everything. It's a great name, the iPhone, because it's all about me. I am important. I am the center of the universe. The postmodern mindset is the triumph of the individual. The individual is the sole source of truth. The individual is the sole source of goodness and beauty. There is no authority that exists outside of the individual in the postmodern mindset. If you want to think about the most pressing social issues that we're dealing with right now, they're all rooted in this problem. You know, it's remarkable how fast we went from talking about gay rights to gay marriage to transgender rights we're still talking about abortion. We're still talking about a little bit less, the right to die. All those things are ultimately about the individual being the authority over all other reality. I can decide what my gender is. I can decide what my sex is. I can decide who I can marry. I can decide what's right and what's wrong. No one can tell me any different. 
It's the postmodern mind. In this mindset, Christ becomes whatever I want him to be. If I need a friend, Jesus is a friend. If I need a teacher, Jesus is a teacher. If I need a long-lost relative, then Jesus is my long-lost relative. Jesus is all about fulfilling my needs and making me feel good. I was watching a, uh, a, a video clip the other day of a young man talking to a young woman. And this young woman, um, there's really no other way to say it, this young woman makes a living prostituting herself on video. And this young man was trying to talk to her about how people would view her decision to prostitute herself on video and make money. And he tried to use his faith as an explanation for why what she was doing was wrong. And she said, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, and Jesus doesn't judge people. So who are you, who are you to judge me? That's it, right there. There's no standard. There's no nothing. It's only about what she wants. Christ is made in her image. And that's all that he is. Again, this text does not give us this as an option. In this chapter, what did we see? In verse 6, the demoniac runs up to Christ's feet and falls down before him. In verse 22, the ruler of the synagogue runs up to Christ and falls at his feet. In verse 33, the woman falls at Christ's feet. What does that mean to fall at his feet? Who would have to walk into this sanctuary for you to fall at their feet? It is an admission that you are in the presence of something different than you. You are acknowledging the supremacy of whatever it is you're falling down in front of. Falling at the feet of Christ is the acknowledgement that he is indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the only proper response to him is to fall at his feet and to worship him. I want to be really blunt with you all. This is not part of our DNA. We do not fall at anyone's feet for any reason at any time or in any place. But that can lead to an unwillingness to fall at the feet of Christ. There is a time and there is a place and there is an acknowledgement of an authority outside of ourselves. And the only proper response is to fall down at his feet and acknowledge that. Instead, we just use Christ for our own purposes. You know, I study political science for a living. I teach political science. I write about political science for a living. And from my observation, uh, all sides of our political spectrum are willing to use Christ for their own purposes politically. It's very interesting. When you listen to a liberal person talk about Christ, he looks a lot like Barack Obama. He has the ethics of Karl Marx. He's all about redistributing wealth and caring for the poor. He's about uh, universal health care. He's about a liberal economic and social agenda. When I hear conservatives talk about Christ, he looks a lot like Ronald Reagan. He's all for small governments. He's all for a muscular foreign policy. He's against unjust government power. Now, I'm not here to argue about which of these things is the better approach to politics. But that's not the point. The point is Christ isn't about advancing your political agenda. Christ is about his sacrifice on the cross, which is necessary because of our sins, so that we may have eternal life as a result. And when you drag Christ into political argument, you are pulling him off of the cross by definition when you do it. 
Because again, Christ is in your image, in your political ideology. Again, the text here does not give us this as an option. We are so tempted to tug and to pull Jesus into who we want him to be that we're willing to give up who he really is. And I'm just going to be real honest with you. The only hope that I have in life is that Jesus is who he says he is. That's it. Because if Jesus were not who he says he is, I don't know why I'd get out of bed in the morning. If I don't have a guarantee of eternal life, if I don't know that someone has died so that my sins might be forgiven, if I don't know that I can have hope in his power over death and his power over sickness and his power over evil and his power over nature, then what in the world am I doing here? The fact that Christ is who he says he is and that I can believe that and that I can hold on to that every day gives me the greatest hope I can possibly have. I don't need Christ to be anything else. Who he is is sufficient enough. And that's what Mark chapter 5 is really all about. Let me close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Abundant Life Church. Thank you for this flock. I pray that you would continue to watch over them. I pray that you would bring them a pastor. I pray that you would reveal your son to them newly and freshly and that you would continue to affirm the hope that we have in you. Please bless us. Bless our time together. Continue to give us the strength and the perseverance that we need for tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.